I'm told that you're supposed to begin every talk by introducing yourself and establishing your credibility and expertise and so on. But I think that's more for the Java crowd who need to know that you have advanced degrees in architecture, astronautics. We're still a young community. And hopefully, the talk will either live or die on its own merits. But for those of you who are interested, I'm from Toronto. And you know the rule is the further the speaker travels, the more you listen to them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that rule is evaporating in the age of the internet, personally, but um, I'm going to milk it for as long as I possibly can. So um, I'm about to give some, uh, share some of my experience and opinions uh, with you and about design and about communication. And my talk violates all of the things I'm going to tell you uh, in that my talk somewhat My talk somewhat rambles around a central theme and then comes back to it. But the underlying message is that good design obviously involves thinking about a user. And we developers are a user as well. And we are the user of our software architecture and our software design, not the user experience, but of the design of the way we organize and, and write it. And um, many people compare that to building architecture. And uh, many people have written long essays saying this is a terrible idea and that there aren't nearly as many parallels between building architecture and software architecture as people would like them to be. But that doesn't mean we can't learn some things from building uh, architecture. And uh, um, today I'm going to share with you some of the things I've learned from a, a particular architect, a woman who wrote a book called The Not-So-Big House, featuring this... Uh, can, there, can anybody see the text under there? Or is that completely invisible? Oh, that's really clever of me. Oh, my goodness. OK, this is what we call unobtrusive <laughs> design. That title says, The Not-So-Big House. This is spectacular. Uh, this is my first talk of 2013, and I'm now guaranteed that every single talk will improve on this. <laughs> OK, here we go. So Sarah Suzanka, has anyone heard of this woman? Clearly, she needs to get out more. Um, she wrote a very best-selling book um, called The Not-So-Big House, and then she's moved on. Like many people who write books did, she wrote uh, Chicken Soup for the Venus and Mars, Not-So-Big Soul, and so on, You know, wrote a whole series of not-so-big books. Um, the Not-So-Big House, the original, is amazing. Um, the Not-So-Big Remodeling is amazing. And The Not-So-Big Life is really amazing. And I'm going to talk a little bit as a preamble about her philosophy, and then we will get to uh, software design and, and what I've learned from it. So um, all design starts with a problem that needs to be solved. No problem, no design. Same thing, you know, people sometimes complain about clients or bosses or users and say, blah, 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 problem, problem, problem. No problem, we just go away. This room empties if there are no problems. This is what we do. Um, so, the problem that she's trying to solve uh, with her philosophy, she works with single family dwellings. That's her specialty. No big universities or whatever, people's homes. Um, her philosophy deals with what is unique for each um, homeowner, as opposed to what all homeowners have in common. And for me, this is an underlying philosophy of software design. The most important thing is what is different about each application, not what they share which is bizarre because our industry actually emphasizes the other thing. You know, we have entire conferences devoted to, say, Ember.js or Ruby. And I'm not sure if I had a magic wand that I would waste it on reorganizing the way we do conferences. But honestly, it might be valuable to have an entire conference devoted to banking software where you talk to people who do COBOL and so on about the domain and about the problems as opposed to <laughs> talking with other people who are doing Ruby and working in completely different uh, problem uh, domains than, than we do. Uh, probably there should be both, but I believe our industry tends to emphasize what applications have in common as opposed to what they ha um, are different. Um, she believes, as many people do, that the form follows functionality, and as a result, um, you know, I mean, that's a bit of a cliche in design. The, str the strong thing is, if you look at one of our houses, it should be obvious to you, without even meeting the owners, what kind of people they are, what their lifestyle is like. 
you know, if you go into many model ho homes, you know, that are for tr uh, what we call tract houses in North America, you know, where they build a whole bunch in a subdivision, and you go in there, they're completely sterile of what kind of person they might be. And then uh, inexperienced people will buy one of these houses, and then they'll look in the magazines and they'll, you know, decorate their house and so on, and it will again be completely sterile. You'll go in there, and if you don't know them, you have, you know, it could be the house three doors down or five doors down, and this doesn't make any sense. You really want a house where if you were to go in, you know immediately who they are. Now, we're sort of on the cusp of this, but in our children's time, nobody uh, will ever go into a house and look at, say, somebody's bookcase and get an idea of what kind of person they are by, look, by looking at the books that they read, right? Because it'll all be on electronic media. It just as, you know, a previous generation looked at someone's vinyl records to get an idea of what kind of person they, they are. Did they have Kind of Blue by Miles Davis? Did they, you know, did they have uh, Rolling Stones, you know? Um, but houses should reflect uh, who we are because it's a, it's a functional piece of equipment. It's not decoration. And her big thing is, given a particular uh, customer's budget, typically they can afford about 4,000 square feet. It's very bizarre. She's American, so they have this, I don't know if anyone you know, a foot is like this much, you know, some ups. And, you know, a square foot is like this. I don't know if you can see here. It's about that much. You know, a meter is far more sensible, right? It's one ten thousandth of the distance from the, from the North Pole to Paris. <laughs> Am I correct? Something like that? Or is that a kilometer? I, it, <laughs> and a meter is one, th one thousandth of it. But you know, Paris, everyone understands Paris, right? So, um, but given that their customers have a budget for about a 4,000 square foot house, which is a good house for someone with a fair bit of money in America, and I'm told everyone has a lot of money in America, um, she would prefer to design for them with the same budget, a 2,400 square foot house, with the same budget than to give them a 4,000 square foot house. And the trick, of course, is how can she make a 2,400 square foot house deliver more value for them than they would have got if they'd spent the same money on a 4,000 square foot house? I've been trying to convince my customers for years that they should get, pay me the same amount of money for 400 hours as, and I'll do 240 hours, but I'm not as successful as she has been at, at this proposition. But let me explain why she's successful with it. This is what most people buy in America, about 4,000, 3,500 square feet. It's got some nice sort of elevation. This is the design, like the builder, they show you this, this, uh, this piece of paper or whatever with this, they call it an elevation. And despite all the little sort of pretend drawings on there, this is a box. It's basically a big box. It's the it's the way in which you deliver the maximum amount of square footage for the minimum amount of money. You're optimizing for square foot per dollar. So you get these uh, vaulted and double height spaces that look really nice. You know, the entrance is very tall. Um, maybe the uh, living room is very tall with a big window on the back. You've got boxes. And the, if this is the lot of the that is placed on, you know, they, they go as far as the law will allow, close to the edge, so they can get as many houses as possible in a small amount of space. So everything is organized around having a big house. And this is the problem she's trying to solve. Big houses are mass produced with limited customization. Corners cost money, so if you have like a little box and so on, all of those things cost as much money as maybe a whole other room. They don't require any domain knowledge. Builders don't need to know who you are or what your lifestyle is like or the fact that you, you know, you're a programmer or an art lover or a musician. You know, people just come in and, and, and build boxes. And uh, the fourth part, there's nothing in there representing the person who buys the home except the check. So when asked, what problem is the big house solving? The big house solves the conversion of this to this, selling it. Everything about the big house is organized to sell, which makes sense because the big houses are built by builders who are running it a business. Their problem is they sell to people who don't know a lot about houses. 
And people who don't know a lot about houses don't know how to value one house versus the other. So they tend to go for superficial things that are easy to measure. Now there's another talk you could give, which is about how management often works the same way. Inexperienced managers organize everything around superficial things that are easy to measure. Lines of code. Um, I don't want to bring some large corporation into it, but whether you're in the office or working remote, these are things that are easy to measure, right? So, you know, if you don't have a lot of other stuff going for you, you know, you tend to focus on these things that are obvious and superficial, but they don't necessarily represent value. And the problem is, and this isn't a bad thing, if someone's 20-something or even 30, and they don't have a ton of experience in how homes work, why should they? If they lived at home until they were 20, and they've only had 10 years out, out in the world, of which six were spent in an apartment and four were spent maybe sharing a house, how are they supposed to have a ton of experience about how homes work, how they age, how people change over time? This is actually a difficult subject. So as a result, most home buyers are uncertain. The uncertainty creates fear. <coughs> And fearful people cling to the simple and obvious, going back to the management of a very large corporation that's in a great deal of trouble in our industry. You know, you can tell when people are fearful because they, they look for these simple solutions, or maybe for cliches, or do this, or let's adopt agile, or let's drop agile, or let's rewrite everything. And the bottom line is that selling a house by the number of square feet is as simple as obvious as it can get. I know you're being very patient with all this talk of houses, but deep in this is, are some real truisms about our industry, about how things are designed and about how things are sold. The less experienced and the less knowledgeable somebody is who's making the decision, the more they will be organized around things that are simple, obvious, measurable, and less about things that are more subjective, elegant, maintainable over time, technical debt, these types of things all require judgment, they require experience, and they tend, the people who focus on those tend to be more experienced and more knowledgeable. You will fail in this industry if you get those things backwards, if you try to sell subtle things to people who are inexperienced and fearful, or try to sell simple, uh, you know, sort of cliche, easy to observe things to people who are actually very experienced, who will say, you're selling me snake oil. So, we end up with these houses. People don't actually like living in big cavernous spaces. It's not our nature. We don't feel comfortable. Bedrooms actually feel more comfortable when the ceiling is low than the ceiling is high. We don't, even when we go in outside to go camping, we put a little tent over our head so that we have a little, you know, little space we feel comfortable in, you know, rather than sleeping out in the great outdoors. It's kind of fun once in a while in the hammock or whatever, but you know, really, we as humans aren't comfortable with these things. But people sell them to us because when you're in the showroom, oh my God, look at this bedroom. And that goes on forever and ever. So, with that preamble out of the way, I want to talk about software and use some of the principles that she uses in her design and, and use them as an excuse to talk about software design. And of course, I've stolen her name. This says the not-so-big software designer it would if I had realized that this would not be visible on the, uh, on the big screen. I don't normally give a talk twice, but if I do, I may do some restyling of this. So, we have a problem too. I'm speaking about SMB, oh, TLAs, three-letter acronyms, small, medium business, departmental applications. I have some experience with much bigger applications, but if you're here from Oracle or whatever, I don't necessarily have a lot of experience to share with you. Um, to me, a not-so-big software design emphasizes what's unique for each application, not what's um, sort of common to all applications. It's not interesting to me if we say, you know, model view controller that, you know, all applications have models, views, and controllers, that doesn't tell me a lot about a particular application. Um, to me, you know, delayed job versus this versus that is not as interesting as what is the form of the domain? You know, what is it people are doing with it? So, and to me, a not so big software design, the form follows the domain not follows the sort of implementation. It follows what people are doing with it. And 
the popular, I think, my thesis is that the, just as in houses, the popular conception of value is number of square feet or volume per dollar. To me, the popular conception of value in frameworks and libraries tends to be, do they give me a place to put all my stuff? Do you know, is there some sort of default, what's that word, Japanese, omakase, here, do it this way. And uh, to me, the not so big software design says, okay, that's great, and it's a good way to get started, but then as soon as we're up to speed, we need to cut that loose. It's not as valuable as, as people would say. And, you know, one asks why. What's wrong with putting all the controllers in a folder called controllers if that's what your particular popular framework does? So, just as there are big houses, I believe there are big frameworks. Of course, the people from Oracle will laugh at what we call big frameworks. But to me, when I think of the big framework, I think of you know, the fundamental difference between a framework and a library. A library says, here's a great set of tools, go build a house. A framework says, here's a framed house, start nailing walls and things on, on it. They're really designed for mass production. I mean, we only talk about how, you know, the market is consulting and so on. But really, it's, it's a very mass production thing, taking, you know, if you always work with Rails, CoffeeScript, Backbone, you know, it's like, you tend to get this idea that one client is just like another, or one application is just like another. You focus on what the, these things have in common, not how they're different. And of course, they give you boxes to put all your stuff, which is very nice. I'm a disorganized person. It's very seductive to me for someone to say, here's a way to organize your stuff. And, you know, one talks about economics, even when things are free and open source, there are forces that I would say are economics that drive why they become popular. And, you know, the economics of big frameworks, the second point is by far the most important. They provide an easy on-ramp for new developers. If there's a bunch of people who are just switching over from, say, PHP, being able to say, hey, you can be productive and make a to-do app or a restaurant menu or something in 15 minutes, look at the screencast, that is sexy. That drives a lot of adoption. And that's good, because if you didn't have it, there wouldn't be a framework to begin with. And you have this design that doesn't really say anything about it's for banking or it's for online shopping or something. And that's very seductive, because it gives the illusion that someone with big framework experience has a portable skill that will work in any industry. That's kind of a wonderful idea. Hey, I'm a carpenter. I can do any kind of carpentry because I'm a carpenter as opposed to saying, I'm a residential home builder, or I'm a, you know, office tower builder, or I build ships. You know, you just think carpentry, wood, I can do it all. And um, I don't think this is true for most conscientious developers, but there is a bit of a pressure always to sort of think to yourself, well, if they want something really custom and different, but this is the way it's all done, to think, well, you know, in the long run, I'm doing them value because it'll be easier for them to get other people to maintain their work if I try to keep it all within sort of the way everybody does it as opposed to really customizing for them. When in reality, perhaps we're serving our own interests by, you know, working with this steady set of tools. So, you know, big frameworks solve this problem and they solve it well. At the beginning of a project, whether it be your startup, your weekend plan, or, you know, a major project, they give you something to do right away. And it's at a time when you have the maximum uncertainty, right? This is when you know the least. Now, you know, you can set up these uh, very old school types of things where you spend a lot of time documenting all the requirements and so on, which create the illusion that you know everything. But we know that in actuality, at the beginning of a project, you know the least. And you would think that this would be the time when you want to delay making any permanent decisions about the project, because you don't know enough about the project yet. But the big framework says not to worry. Here's a bunch of permanent decisions that are very safe to make. Right? You're going to have this folder here, and this folder here, and this folder here, and you're going to put this kind of thing in this folder, and this kind of thing in this folder, and everything's going to work out. And 
I don't know, without coffee and so on and, and, and so on, maybe you don't necessarily grab it. But for me, I really feel like this is exactly the same thing as being very inexperienced, 30 years old, you know, married a couple years, ready to buy that first home. And somebody says, you know, it's a lot like every other home. You can't possibly go wrong. You're getting a lot of value. You can measure the value. No one's ever going to look at you and say, you bought what? You know, and the big framework really, you know, gives us that. I just said that. We don't need to read it. So, you know, this parallels a bit. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing at the beginning of a project to say, I'm uncertain. To me, I have no, you know, machismo or investment. It's like, I know that. I'm uncertain. I'm, I'm organizing myself around re resolving this uncertainty. I don't want to lie to myself. And I, outside of a, you know, a presentation like this, I don't really want to walk around telling everyone I'm fearful. I'd like to say I'm managing risk. <laughs> but this is true of developers as it is of home buyers. Well, I certainly can say it's true of me. When I'm feeling pressure, fear, uncertainty, I want to cling to the simple and obvious. It's not a good time to be doing subtle, complicated things and taking big chances. So I look for the simple and obvious. I'm human. And this is as simple and obvious as it, to me as you can possibly get. You've got a lot of uncertainty. You're not sure what to do. If somebody says to you, I give you this thing, you can get started right away. There's a bunch of low risk work you can do and you're not gonna later come along and wanna rewrite it and move everything everywhere else because if you put a controller in this folder called controllers, it will always live there. And you won't later say to yourself, oh man, why do we organize things like this? Where do I find you know, the, the controllers that we need for doing you know, uh, log on? Where do we put them? No, it'll always be here. So you feel like this is no risk. And I ask, you know, does this result in poorly designed software later? And being a kind of analogy guy, and also being born in 1962, I built one of these the other day. It's a, a Lego model of a 1962 VW uh, camper van. And to me, I, I suppose I should have stuck with the house analogy, but I built this the other day. It is obvious upon first inspection what this is and what it is used for. It is true that it has an internal combustion engine, four wheels, doors for getting in and out, windows for seeing, a steering wheel, a thing like this that, as far as I can tell from having driven uh, standard VWs, is used for making a grinding noise. Um, it has... You know, this is the beauty of mainframes. That never happens. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, there's something really amazing about that. Something we take for granted about physical things like VW uh, camper vans. If you take another look at it, you can tell. You get in and out, you have dinner in this thing, you can sleep in it. The uh, top pops up so that tall people can stand up inside there. This to me is good design, right? Like you know what it is. You're on, this, you're on the lot, you won't accidentally buy this to go drag racing or something. But, if this was a project using a popular framework, this is what you would see. A list of components organized by color and shape. It is not obvious at first inspection that this pile of components corresponds to a VW van. I don't know looking at a new project, what it's supposed to do. I don't know how the pieces relate. 
It's far from interesting to me that all the controllers are in one file to get, uh, one folder together. What does, they don't even actually have a relationship to each other. They're completely independent. You could just scatter them all over the project and it would still work the same way. The tests in almost every project I've ever seen are always over there. In software development as we understand it now, this is one of the most important things we have in the project, the automated tests. We do things like we have um, post GitHub commit hooks that actually update a little image that shows red or green right on the GitHub page when you look at the project to say whether all the tests are running. And the test for a model is nowhere near the model. This does not communicate to me that there's something important about the test or the model and the relationship to each other. I don't think that the way we organize things now is really optimized for the stuff that we do most of the time, which is add features, change features, grow the software. So, oh, wrong <coughs> slide. Let me fix that. There we go. Yes, okay. The problem with big frameworks, and again, you know, with all due respect, there wouldn't be there if they didn't do this thing well, which is sell us on getting started. But the problem is they persist because they sell well, but we don't sort of adapt once we've bought it. We don't kind of adapt, we don't remodel it. It might be better to custom design something from the beginning in a different way like with Sarah Susanka, but if you can't do that, you can at least remodel your house after you've bought it and understand your lifestyle. We don't do that either. So, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that so that our projects can look like this. This is the interior of one of the homes she's designed. I don't know if it would suit me personally or you personally. She would say it's not important that it suit you personally. The opposite. It's important that it suit that actual owner personally and that what she would build for you would be completely different if you're completely different. <clears throat> so I want to share with you some habits, some ideas. And again, I think you could pick any three or four or five ideas. Um, it's not so much important that you think to yourself, he's saying we should do this, this, and this, as much as I'm trying to share with you an example of what you would do if you're thinking this way. So here's a problem. And this is a problem with all software. It's not a problem with frameworks. A line of code is a line of code is a line of code in programming languages. The compiler, I call it the compiler because I'm old school, interpreter, environment, JVM, whatever, the system, it doesn't care whether that line of code is used once in a very long time for an error handling condition or whether that line of code is used all the time for a very common use case. It's all just, there's all just lines of code. And if you just write code, it all looks the same. It's just a pile of stuff. The analogy with a home is something like, now somebody somewhere in this room is, uh, regularly gives dinner parties and this does not apply to you. But for the rest of us, the formal dinner party is something that we do a couple of times a year. If you give a formal dinner party four times a year, you're exceptional. Nevertheless, most homes have this huge formal dining room, but we eat in the kitchen. This is an actual design of Sarah Suzankas. And she said, screw it. Even though these people have a lot of money, there is no formal dining room. This first floor is organized around the way these people actually live. But a couple times a year, she's designed it so that you can move a little furniture and throw a beautiful formal dinner party. Now, you know, when you're like 20 something and you have to move things to make a formal dinner party, you say to yourself, man, I can't wait until I've got enough money that I can afford a house where I've got a formal dining room. But the fact of the matter is when you do have that money, you could spend it on other things like a cottage, or you could spend it on having finer finishings or better furniture. If it isn't something you actually need, it's not a good use of your money, time, and space. And the same is true of software. 
Even if you have the time and the team of thousands of people and outsourcers and so on, if something is unnecessary or infrequent, it should not take up all this space in the code, in the project, it shouldn't be visible. I, we have a lot of advanced capabilities in languages like, like Ruby. And of course we can do cool or fun things like um, make a method that takes an array of strings and pluralizes them and knows whether to put, I don't know, you can argue about the Oxford comma one and two and three or one comma two comma and three or, or whatever. But we can also use these techniques to look at, you know, people talk about whether you should have fat models or not or fat controllers. To me, this is not an important distinction. Whatever you choose, what I'd like to see is that even if at runtime, a model has 100 methods, I'm okay with that. But when I look at the code, I'd like to see what looks like a skinny model that has the 10 most common methods, and then it has some includes, or there's some monkey patching, or there's some something, so that I, there's some other file somewhere else that has the remaining, uh, what did I say, 10 methods, 90 methods in, d in different places. We have those capabilities, and we should use them to hide the things that aren't used as commonly, or put them where they belong, just like the formal dining room, so that when you're actually working with the things you do most of the time, all of the time, you just have in front of you what you need. I'm a big believer in gems. Not just, well, here's this common thing that we need in five different projects, so we should make it a gem. But even if a gem is only used in one project, it is a way of saying, this thing is such a side issue, kind of like a garage, that we're just going to put it off over here, so it's not even in our code. You know, like importing, exporting, something like that, just throw it in a gem. If it's not being edited, changed, used all of the time, why should it be sitting in the main part of your project when it could be one line in your gem file or whatever configuration, doohickey in your particular uh, framework? Like, we have these tools, and using them in order to choose to communicate what is important and what is common and what is the main use case. I mean, we do this with the user interface, right? If I showed you a Microsoft Windows 95 type form with like a million checkboxes and stuff, you'd say, Reg, you have no idea of visual design. You should have the obvious things here and you should have like an advanced tab or a wizard and you know, you should move all these things around so that you know, it's really obvious what to do, the main path and so on and advanced users are off somewhere else. You'd give me all this lecture. And then if I turned around and did all of your suggestions but made all of the code one you know, sort of monolithic file or whatever, we might say cool and forget about it when in reality we should do the same thing with our code that we did with the form. And if you're interested, you can Google the Williams style with my name. It's a little thing. But we're a little short of time, so I'll just keep going. So, I guess I've been beating this, uh, this dead horse, as we say. Uh, all the, you know, a house with all the bathrooms on one floor and the bedrooms on another floor, to me, is like a framework with all the control... Is that me? Ah, is, you know, it's like controllers, models, views, assets, images. I believe we should organize code by how it's used. Now, I know that Rails, for example, allows you to say, hey, you know what? Not only can I look for all of my code in, you know, controllers, views, models, lib, but I can also create my own folders. I can create a shopping folder, a banking folder, I can create a administration folder, I can make all the folders I want and, and, and tell it to look for all my, my files in there. That's true of every framework and if it isn't, get in there and monkey patch it. You ought to be able to organize things the way you would if they were pieces of paper, you would have an organization for them. They'd be organized by client file or something. I also believe that you know, we have these modules and things. We should do the same thing. Organize code. If I look at a, uh, a model, there should only be a little bit of code in there and most of the stuff that isn't important should be in a mod module somewhere and that module should be able to have bits for controllers, bits for views, bits for models, you know, it should organize like with like. Now again, I, don't, I can't give you an exact example because it would vary from domain to domain. I 
Then we have the fun of documentation. Code is documentation. And we're supposed to care about that. And I don't have anything to say about documenting implementation code because I don't think anyone has the answer to how to keep, the, you know, your, what to write and, and how to keep it in sync with what's actually going on. But, it's a controversial subject. I do believe that we should use what I call maximally literate text code, te test code. Namely, you know, we have specs. We, use, we have, I think there are more frameworks for, for tests in Ruby than there are frameworks in any other language or something, or several of them combined. You know, it's, it's, we have a fetish for, for testing frameworks. And to me, that's cool, and that's appropriate, because tests really are a form of documentation, and it's documentation that is automatically checked. We do keep it in sync by running the tests against our code and by finding ways to embarrass or humiliate people who check in code without, uh, what's the thing, alias YOLO equals git commit blah blah blah, you know, put, if you can push your code without testing, you know, and deploy it all in one step while, before leaving for the weekend, you know, I, and, and we laugh about that, but we really work hard to make sure that the tests reflect what's happening with the code and the code with the tests. So this is actually a great area to really invest and we have techniques for this. For example, uh, there's a product called Doco from the same guy who did CoffeeScript and Underscore, um, which allows you to uh, put mark, a markdown markup in your Ruby comments, and then you run Doco on it, and it makes an HTML page that you could share with um, domain experts, or maybe you're a domain expert. I believe that, that you, know, you should be able to, when you deploy, deploy your documentation at, this, at the same time of all of the tests. I couldn't remember the name, and I did some Googling last night, and I couldn't find it, so I apologize for my lack of research. But there used to be um, a wiki that allowed you to embed test uh, code in it. And the idea was that you would share it in an agile environment with you know, domain experts, clients, whatever, and they would be able to do things like make a little table of what the results should be from a particular thing. I, I don't know how well it worked, but I love the idea. And we should really, I believe, think hard about this. And I believe it's part of the not-so-big software design because it's all about making sure that if I come and look at your project, I know what it does. I know what it's for. You know, I don't look at it and say, oh, it's a Rails project. I look at it and say, oh, it's a site where consultants can find clients and clients can find consultants. That's like obvious the first thing I, lo I, I look at. Or it's a site for organizing conferences. Or it's a site where people can buy and sell something. You know, like that should be the first thing I think of. And having really well documented test code is part of that. And we have an amazing number of tools. I know we're getting a little short on time. So here's a nice picture of, of a very beautiful um, clock tower. <laughs> um, so the three things I've sort of talked about here as habits. Again, they're examples of a type of thinking. I'm not trying to be prescriptive. I'm trying to say, hey, this is an example of what happens when you think like Sarah Suzanka does about the house. This will all be on the net, but by all means, take, uh, take pictures. Um, uh, hide or de-emphasize the infrequent or the unimportant. I believe code should be organized by use cases or how it's used, not by shallow things like types. I mean, it seems silly to me, but if I invented a new computer language and I said, so in one file you put all the integers, And I believe that text, test code should be maximal, maximally literate. It's the one place where we have some sort of a guarantee that we'll be looking at it and updating it regularly. And returning to what I said was kind of the unwritten message, you know, recognize that what was important to us when we started a project or first picked up a framework is not what's important to us once we have more knowledge about the domain, more knowledge about 
our experience as programmers, our experience of how projects work, and we have to change and acquire new habits and not sort of assume that what worked for us well, what on-ramped us, is what we should persist with uh, for all time. The second point I think is a little obvious, right? We emphasize what's, uh, what's frequent and important. That should be the same with our code. And finally, and this is a, the thing, I mean, people pay lip service to this. You know, that, that we should design for the maintenance programmer in mind, and that's why we'll use Java or whatever. But, you know, good design it really is about saying, what is the actual use case that you are going to use for this? If you're working, you know, in a client environment, you're going to go off, do a new project, blah, 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 and then a year from now, they're going to ask you to quote on some upgrade or something, and you're going to come back and not have, having seen it for a while. Design with that in mind. Like, how would that work? What would you, what would you do? Or they'll get somebody else. Think about that person. You know, how are you going to communicate to them? Oh, no problem, it's a Rails project. That's not helpful. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I see this is a project that involves this, 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 and this, and everything I need to know about user sign-ons and so on is over here, which will really help because the client has asked me to allow people to log in with Twitter credentials. And I don't have to look, you know, do a, like a grep through the code for, for the word Twitter. I know that everything, or the word login, I know that all the login stuff is over here, whether it's a controller or a model or whatever. You know, think about that case. And this really, again, I've rambled around it. I haven't followed my own advice. I haven't organized my talk around this. But this is what I want you to leave with is this last thought. You are an important user. And as an important user, you deserve actual time to think about the design. Not necessarily to agree with my particular taste in design, but certainly you deserve some thought about what might work for you now that isn't the same as everyone else. And that is, as they say, that. I'm done. Thank you. Any questions? We have three more minutes. Yes. I just uh, like uh, I very really like the, the analogy with development of, of houses and development of software. But I think like it misses like very big point that a lot of time what we do is we take a home that somebody already built and we need to rebuild it. Yes. So, when it's done like with the frame house style, with the big framework, then it's much, much more like, easier. I mean, you just go in, you see, right? You know where the tests are, you know where it's the test for your user model because it's in the test of models of user. Right. So, yeah, so it's actually uh, the design here is much better because you know where the stuff is, even if you've never like seen it before. So actually, the use case is that you do things like in the standard way, and then everybody can do it. Well, I think that that is certainly the proposition. And I think that when you are first approaching it, that works, and it continues to work to a certain degree. But if you think about the house, imagine the plumbing was in one room and the electrical in another room it's true if you need to do an electrical thing you go into the electrical room and there is all the electricity and you go into the plumbing room and there is all the plumbing but when you're renovating a bathroom it can also be helpful to know that everything to do with the bathroom is in the bathroom that you're going to be touching more than one thing so i agree that it's possible to take some of these ideas and make a complete mess of it I mean, you know, it's just like architects sometimes design these things that look very beautiful but are terrible to work with, and the, and the roofs leak and so on. If you look up architects, they're, I don't know why we elevate them like this. Most of the time, they really do some screwed up stuff. But um, don't even get me started on the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. But with some judicious use, you know, you might do something like, um, you know, I was thinking of login or something like this or transactions. Within the, if you had a transactions uh, folder and within that you had tests, 
mo uh, models, controllers, and so on, you have a bit of the best of both worlds. You know I'm looking for transactions, and within that you have some subdivision, but you don't necessarily have the transactions controllers sitting right next to the login uh, and authentication controllers. Now again, Sarah's message is every house is different. So, and so, you know, you have to uh, take that into account. And it could be that some projects really do suit the original, you know, uh, architecture better than others. But some others, you know, might suit thinking to yourself, I wonder if I can uh, change this a little bit. Could we get one more? Yeah, or? yeah I just um, want to say, actually, uh, using a similar approach on a Rails project, so we have a modules directory with name modules, and for each like a model controller uh, views directory, um, and it works quite well. Um, although, yeah, you have to do quite a bit of like patching in Rails to make sure. Um, and then basically, we, we just like we only define models modules there that we then include in the actual model, so you see the models to like all the aspects that it has. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but sometimes like because Rails is so like dogmatic, you're really working against Rails. And that's a trade-off as well. I mean, you can have these wonderful designs, but if they don't really suit the materials being used, you end up with <laughs> rickety houses. So, you know, there's no, there's no easy answer. There's no, I can't just say, and then everyone goes, oh my God, why didn't David Hennemeyer Hansen think of that? He's such an idiot. It doesn't work like that. These are all, it requires judgment. And, you know, not all of the things I'm suggesting are right if you don't have a lot of experience in the domain or don't have a lot of experience with development. You know, these are things, if you are new, these are things you th that perhaps you think to yourself, I want to keep an eye on this as I grow in my career and see if some of these ideas that Reg is saying will begin to make more sense, you know? And if you're more experienced, you may say, well, there's a bunch of things which don't work for me, but if there's one idea I can take from this, it's a good, it's a, it's a good presentation. So it, these do require some judgment. All right, big thanks to Reg. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.